summer's over, this town is closing, they're waving people out of the ocean. We have the feeling. Hello and welcome to the like recorded we study floating. guide for the third QA. This QA covers unit six and seven. So if you have your previous study guides from unit six or seven, you can use those to kind of follow along with this as well. We're cutting some stuff, uh, talking about some other stuff as well. So uh, we start um, with the first thing on your study guide, just like always, is Alexander Hamilton. Um, he is going to be on page 315. We're talking about Alexander Hamilton in connection with the next thing, which is uh, Hamilton's plan. That's also on page 315. This is obviously Alexander Hamilton. You've seen him on the $10 bill. Uh, Hamilton's plan has three main parts, and the main goal of it is to get the uh, war debt paid off. So they want to cover the war debt, make sure that's all paid off, and we can handle that. Um, mainly what you need to understand is that he wants to do this because he thinks that if we don't pay off our debt, then nobody, no other country is going to take us seriously. Kind of like if you loan somebody $20 and then they don't pay you back and then they ask you for more money, you're obviously going to say no. So this is what Hamilton's thinking. We've borrowed money from other countries and if we want them to take us seriously and do business with us, we have to pay them back. So part of it is that he wants to put in a tariff, uh, which is you know, an tax on an imported good. Uh, we've talked about tariffs a lot. They make the uh, foreign good more expensive. So therefore, uh, people buy the homemade good like the United States product more often. So the other part is that he wants to make a national bank. Uh, all of this is in an effort to pay off the war debt. That's uh, the main issue that you need to th focus on with Hamilton's plan. Next thing we look at on your study guide are these two treaties. On your study guide, these two treaties are on the same uh, same line. Uh, both of them are pa found on page 323. Let's go with a three there. Um, when we look at these two treaties, um, it's less important to know kind of the basic details of the treaties. Um, it's more important to know kind of general things about them. So Jay's treaty, we're talking about uh, a treaty with the British. Pinckney's treaty, we're looking at a treaty with the Spanish. Both of these treaties settle some disputes over land. So if we look at this map, you can kind of see that Jay's treaty is going to settle things in the north with Britain and then uh, Pinckney's treaty is going to settle things down here in Spanish Florida. So the goal here is that we settle a border. And that's mainly the big issue with Jay's treaty and Pinckney's treaty. It settles frontier tensions because we get kind of this defined line of where our country ends. Um, and then pretty soon we'll talk about expanding that line. But for then, those two treaties help ease frontier tension. Now, George Washington is the president at the time that this is all happening, but at the end of his second term, he decides that he wants to retire. Now, the important thing to look at when we look at Washington retiring is kind of his farewell speech or his address at the end that talks about things that he would like the United States to do. This um, is all outlined on page 328, and he talks about staying neutral in world affairs. Uh, he also talks about maybe not having political parties because, you know, staying neutral in foreign affairs, that's obvious because he doesn't really want us to get involved too heavily with other nations because what if something bad goes on over in Europe and we're heavily involved and then we'd get dragged into this war and it's just not a good situation for us to be in. He also wants us to not have as many political parties and political differences, because if we do, he doesn't really think that political parties serve the American citizen very well, because really everybody would just be fighting back and forth in between their political party and not really getting anything done. Um, and with that advice, uh, people completely ignore him, and they go ahead and have political parties in the very next election, uh, which is the election of 1796. 
basically we see the formation of two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. This whole thing, all three of these is all three of these can be found on page 329. Um, need to know that the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans were the first two political parties. It would be nice to know a little bit of details about each of those parties. You can find the, a nice chart on this on page 329. Uh, Federalists are going to have more of a strict view of the Constitution. Democratic Republicans, sorry. Federalists are going to have more of a loose view of the Constitution. Democratic Republicans are going to have more of a strict view of the Constitution. We've talked about that before. We have, you know, like if we're looking at interpretations of a number line, I've got one, two, three, four, five. If I have a strict view of the Constitution, that means that I only have five options, one, two, three, four, and five. There's no reading between the lines. If I have a loose view like the Federalist, I have um, things in between here like 1.5, 3.5, 45, 23. You know, there's just a wider range of options, so therefore the government can do more things if I have a loose view of the Constitution and uh, – the government can grow larger. But the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, they compete in the election of 96 and ends up where John Adams is the winner. So John Adams wins and Thomas Jefferson is the the first runner up or he comes in second. And at that and at this time in elections, um, when somebody becomes the, the first runner-up or this person in second place, that's how they choose the vice president. So Thomas Jefferson becomes vice president in 96 because of the fact that he was second in the overall election. So John Adams wins the election of 1796. During his presidency, he runs into a few issues. One of them has to do with uh, France and the XYZ affair. The XYZ affair can be found on page 330. Um, if you remember back to the XYZ affair, we have some things that we're trying to get settled. The French are taking our ships out in the Atlantic Ocean. We want that to obviously stop. So John Adams sends some people over to France, and they kind of get cornered and say, and they're told that if they want to have peace talks and have a discussion about them stop stopping to take our ships, we're probably going to have to give them a whole bunch of money as like a bribe. So $10 million loan, $250,000 bribe, um, just kind of this kind of shady stuff that isn't really fair to us. So the people that we send over come back. They tell John Adams. It's a huge deal. It's called the XYZ Affair. Um, it makes Federalists pretty popular. They get a lot of power, but ultimately they kind of abuse that power when they put in the Alien and Sedition Acts, which are on page 331. Uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts limit a lot of free speech and a lot of freedom of the press. And what that does is it makes people pretty angry, angry because when people – are, have rights taken away. Um, they're not really too thrilled about that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison introduced the idea of states' rights with the Kentucky and Virginia proposal because of the Alien and Sedition Acts. They're thinking, we're trying to get rid of this, this um, act. So they introduced the idea of states' rights, and uh, this is all found on page 330. Two. Really, what you need to focus on is that they say that we can, they could nullify, a state could nullify or get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts if they think it's unconstitutional. Um, it's not successful. These proposals are not successful, but um, it does go a little ways in uh, promoting the idea of states' rights. It's not really a big deal because that it doesn't go through and it doesn't get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts because in just a few years, Thomas Jefferson wins the presidency. He wins the presidency of 1800, which is the next thing on your study guide. This is on page 339. This is the election in which we have a big tie and Thomas Jefferson, there's a whole bunch of voting back and forth. They vote 36 times and eventually Thomas Jefferson is elected president. He wants to shrink the size of the government. He wants to limit the power of all of the branches and just kind of 
um, because remember he's a democratic Republican, so he wants to shrink the government because he has a strict view of the Constitution. And because of this, uh, one of the things that he tries to do is uh, limit the power of some judges. He wants to put his own people in there. Uh, John Adams has already put some people into the whole situation, and that leads to Marbury versus Madison, which is on page 342. Page 342 outlines everything you need to know about Marbury versus Madison. You have you have William Marbury, and he was told that he's going to be a judge. And the way that this works out is that James Madison is supposed to deliver the piece of paper to him. If he doesn't get the piece of paper, he doesn't become a judge. And Thomas Jefferson tells James Madison not to deliver the piece of paper. Well, William Marbury obviously gets pretty angry about this, and he takes him to court. He takes him all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules that they actually can't decide this, and there's really no clear way to decide it. And the reason that this is important is it be- is because it sets up this idea of judicial review. So that's what you need to write here for Marbury versus Madison. You need to understand that it sets up judicial review, which is where the Supreme Court, for the first time, goes back and looks at a law and decides, yeah, you know what, that's actually unconstitutional, so we're going to have to get rid of that. That's the first part of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. The second part has to do with expanding the nation's size with the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase, 345, um, basically the next six terms, no, actually four terms on your study guide, all are going to be on page 345. Not necessarily right on that page, but they're going to start in that section. Um, we buy the Louisiana Purchase from France, so you need to know France. Uh, Napoleon is the guy that's in charge. He's fighting a big war with Britain. He wants the money, not the land. So Thomas Jefferson buys it from him. Originally, we're just going to buy the uh, port of New Orleans, but they they offer us the entire Louisiana territory, and Thomas Jefferson says yes. Um, but you got to remember that he's got a strict view of the Constitution. So he's not really sure if he should be able to buy this or not, because in the Constitution, it doesn't say anything about the president being able to buy land or not. He eventually does it, and uh, for $15 million, three cents an acre, and he sends out uh, the Corps of Discovery to go look for um, anything of interest in the Louisiana Territory, see if we can find an all-water route, see if we can um, make good relationships with Native Americans, make some maps, possibly, and that's what they do. William Clark and Meriwether Lewis are sent out to um, explore the Louisiana Territory. And the main goal here is to search for an all-water route, which obviously they don't find. What they come back with is instead really reliable maps, uh, some good relationships with Native Americans. Remember, this is all on uh, page 345 starts on page 345. You can talk about it from there. Some of the good relationships with Native Americans start because of their uh, Native American guide, Sacagawea. She leads them through the Rocky Mountains. She is able to um, translate for them. And she also, uh, it, it's very important that she is with them because she actually assures other Native American tribes that. Lewis and Clark expedition, it's a peaceful group. It's not like a war party looking to fight a whole bunch. Because she's a woman, she is with them, shows them that they're kind of peaceful. And uh, yeah, so they make it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They come back to St. Louis. Um, They've made some reliable maps. They find out that they don't have an all-water route. But at least the Louisiana Territory has been somewhat explored. Now, we go to start looking at problems that we have with other countries outside of the United States. It starts with the problem of impressment, which is found on page 354. Um, Impressment is this thing that the British did um, where they start taking our ships, and then they not only are taking the ships and the things like the cargo that is on them, but they are also imprisoning or impressing our people that are on the ship 
and then making which means that they are making them fight for the British Navy. They're taking American citizens, making them fight for the British Navy. The British are in a fight with France right now, like I was talking about earlier with Napoleon needing money, and the British are running low on soldiers or sailors, so they're using impressment, gets us very angry. We try, or Thomas Jefferson tries to get them to stop this um, in a peaceful way by putting in the Embargo Act of 1807, which is also on page 354, basically stops trade to all other foreign nations. Um, this hurts us more than it hurts other countries. We are unable to trade. We are unable to make money. So this, all this is going on, and uh, American citizens get very angry at British, at the British. So what ends up happening is in 1812, James Madison is president by this time. We actually declare war on the British. Now, there are a lot of things that happen in the War of 1812, obviously, but we are going to focus right now on the end of the war. The War of 1812 uh, has a major battle at the end of it called the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, this guy down here, Andrew Jackson, is in, in command of a small fighting force of for the Americans. This whole story can be found on page 357. Basically, Andrew Jackson leads them down there. Uh, the British come marching into the Gulf of Mexico, or through the Gulf of Mexico, up through the port of New Orleans, and the Americans um, hand the British a crushing defeat. They win very handedly, and this is because the British are just kind of funneling in to the beach. The Americans have these fortifications. They're able to basically wipe out um, thousands and thousands of British soldiers while the Americans only suffer 73 casualties. The importance here is that it makes Andrew Jackson a hero, and that's going to lead to him later on becoming uh, president or being able to um, get elected president. So with that, happening. It's a very big battle in the War of 1812 because it gains a lot of notoriety for Andrew Jackson, but it actually has no effect on the outcome of the war because the battle takes place after this treaty is signed, the Treaty of Ghent. The Treaty of Ghent is found on page 358. It is the treaty that ends the War of 1812. So I would write that down. It ends the War of 1812. And um, you got to remember that the Battle of New Orleans happened actually after the War of 1812, which is kind of an interesting um, side note. So we see that during this war, we are unable, able to trade with other countries. Um, so we actually become more self-sufficient a little bit. We start making our own things, and that's going to lead us to some, th some of the things that we talk about in the next section here. But also it increases nationalism pride in your country, uh, which is going to also lead to looking at other stuff in the next unit. This is also on page 358. There's a nice little paragraph that kind of outlines um, what's actually going on there. So now let's move on to the next thing on your study guide, which is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution uh, starts on page... Whoa. All right. Let's try that again. Page 365. Um, when we look at the Industrial Revolution, we are basically seeing this huge shift from originally using hand tools like these right here to using machines to make everything. And this comes from, you know, using factory system, going into the factories, making it everything with factory machines and that kind of stuff. Um, Samuel Slater, remember with the little alliteration, he uh, snuck the secrets of spinning mills out of England into and into New England, and he finds that New England is a good place to set up factories for a few reasons. These reasons are talked a little bit about on page 365. 
looking at uh, two main reasons. One is that there's a lot of people in New England that are ready to work in factories because they're tired of scraping together a living with just uh, farming because they, they can't really farm very much in New England. But the other option that uh, is very important for New England is that they had, they had a lot of fast-moving rivers, and the fast-moving rivers are important because without those fast-moving rivers, you can't power your factories. So that's why New England was a good place for them to be. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution, we see a very big change in uh, the way things are made and also just with different inventions. Uh, the first guy that we look at, we'll look at him a little bit here, is Eli Whitney. Uh, he, the part that we're going to talk about right now is on 367, but the real important stuff that we look at with him is on 373. So you might want to write both those pages down. The first thing that he does is he invents interchangeable parts, which is where, uh, like in this picture, instead of, uh, some one person hand making a gun and then if a gun piece of breaks or something, you would have to then start all over or have that person fashion a new piece. Um, instead of doing that, he it comes up with the idea of mass producing just individual pieces, and this piece fits into that piece, and that piece fits into that piece. So, like, you don't have to spend as much time or money or skill on uh, making a gun or any sort of product. So that's his big thing. So interchangeable parts, um, sped up production, um, and then also the fact that it doesn't take as much skill to just mass produce little pieces as it does, you know, handcrafting an entire gun. The next group of people here are all, uh, you know, F.B. Morris, Robert Fulton, Peter Cooper, John Deere. They're all important for separate reasons about like what kind of um, inventions they actually do come up with. Uh, the telegraph, the steamboat, the uh, the locomotive and the steel plow. Now, you have to understand that, you know, these top three here actually all really do a lot to bring the nation closer together because of the telegraph, people can talk better um, and more efficiently, quicker. Uh, steamboat, you can travel easier. Same thing with the train. You can transport goods quicker, um, become kind of closer as a nation. So it's pulling these different parts of the country together. John Deere's plow is important because it uh, increases the ability to farm in the Midwest, which, you know, produces more food so more people can go work in the factories and not have to just um, uh, farm for a living. They can actually just go buy food that is being grown in the Midwest. That means they can produce things in factories. The factories can get bigger. We can make more things. We can sell more things, all that kind of good stuff. All right. Um, the next thing, like I said, there is another important piece to uh, Eli Whitney, who is right here. Um, he invents the cotton gin. This is on page 373, like I had said earlier. The cotton gin is important because it completely transforms the South. It makes it easier to clean cotton. So you can clean 50 times as much cotton. And if you need to clean, if you can clean as 50 times as much cotton, you need 50 times the cotton. So that means that you need 50 times the cotton to be picked. And that means that you need 50 times the slaves. And that's what happens. We see a vast increase in slavery and it all is directly tied to the cotton gin because um, the cotton gin increases the amount of cotton that can be produced. Because of this increase in slavery, we do see an increase in slave rebellions. Um, Nat Turner is one of those. He leads a slave rebellion in Southampton, Virginia. The goal here, obviously, was to uh, break free. This is on page 376. Break free. He organizes some people. Nat Turner does. Goes, um, takes over some plantations. You know, kills some slave owners. All that kind of stuff. Um, but he doesn't actually gain any freedom for anyone because really people just get scared and they start treating the slaves worse and they start passing harsher slave laws. With all of this increased, um, you know, industrial revolution, bringing people closer together, um, this is what is known as nationalism, which is the next thing on your study guide. Three... 
79. That's the page number. Okay, three, uh, the things that you need to understand with nationalism is it's basically just this idea that um, we start thinking about our country, we're loyal to our country um, over the state, and this is known as nationalism. Um, James Madison, who is down here, wants to increase nationalism, and he puts in the American system. The American system has three steps to it, just kind of like Hamilton's plan that we've been talking about. Um, It is going to create a national bank that is going to have um, one type of currency that everybody is going to use. Um, it's going so uh, national bank, one type of currency. Uh, there's going to be tariffs, and it's going to increase transportation. So uh, everybody's going to use the same currency. Everybody's going to have uh, tariffs that are going to help promote um, United States businesses, and we're going to improve transportation so we can move quickly between the states and we can transport things from one state to the other so we can work closer together. And this is all going to increase nationalism because we're using our own stuff. We're going to use the things that we have available to us. The main goal here is that is that we become self-sufficient. So that's really the main goal of the American system. It does succeed um, and doing a lot of good things, you just kind of need to know what what it's the goal and what it does. Uh, sectionalism does start popping up, however, because not only is everybody kind of working together and helping each other, but we also see that uh, things start to pull the sections apart. Uh, you have the West, they want nice cheap land. The South, they want slavery. The North, they want factory workers and things of that nature. They kind of all go against each other a little bit uh, just in kind of their interest, and it kind of leads to the Missouri Compromise, which is on 382. All these kind of issues all come to a point here. Uh, Missouri wants to become a state. Uh, They want to become a slave state. Northern states don't want that because at this time there are 11 free and 11 slave states. So it's even. With Missouri, there would be 12 slave states and that would make it uneven. So they want to – Missouri wants to still become a state, but the northern states want it to be a free state. Um, Southern states want it to be a slave state. And it's just a big deal, and there's going to be a whole bunch of fighting over it. But eventually what it leads to is that this Missouri Compromise made up by Henry Clay, who is down here. And what Henry Clay says is that we'll make Missouri a slave state. Maine is going to be added to the United States as well at this time. It's going to be a free state. And then uh, we'll, we're going to draw a line at the 36th parallel and... Above that, no more slavery. Below that, as much slavery as you want. Um, And that's basically what it does. At the end, the end result is that it maintains that balance between the slave and free state. So you have a 12 and 12, so it's nice and even again. Uh, Another thing during this time period is the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine is important because we start talking – we see – we bank this statement and it says that the Americas are closed to colonization to European nations. And what that means is that we don't want anybody coming over here and kind of taking our space and taking our, um, our land. So this is important because it shows that we see ourselves as like a world power and that we are, just as equal with Britain or France or Spain or whatever. And that's the Monroe Doctrine. So it's about uh, closing the Americas to colonization. Monroe Doctrine can be found on page 384. All right, moving on to uh, Andrew Jackson. When he gets elected, Andrew Jackson uh, implements kind of his Jacksonian democracy named after him, of course. It widens political power to everybody. He's he's not just saying that just uh, landowners can vote. He is wanting to open up it to all white males. This is on page 397. This gets him a lot of support from the common people of the, the United States, um, and that's a big reason why he wins the election. 
Um, so Jacksonian democracy just makes sure he wants to try to get more people the ability to vote. Uh, Andrew Jackson becomes the seventh president of the United States. Thing, A big issue that he has to deal with or that he does deal with, I guess he didn't have to deal with it, but he does deal with it, which is uh, the Native Americans. There are a lot of Native Americans living in the southeast of the United States, and Americans basically have two feelings about them. They can either move out of the country or they can become like Americans and assimilate. And this leads to a whole bunch of fighting, and eventually Andrew Jackson passes the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which is on page 404. Now, the Indian Removal Act basically forces Native Americans to either assimilate and follow state laws or move from their original homelands to the um, Indian Territory, which will become Oklahoma. Um, these journeys, um, especially this one up here in green, taken by the Cherokee, are very harsh and very difficult. You are not allowed to take a lot of stuff. Um, you're forced to march hundreds of miles to the Indian Territory. This, these, this harsh journey for the Cherokees becomes known as the Trail of Tears, which is on page 405. Um, this is kind of a really big uh, kind of mistake, if you will, for Andrew Jackson. I mean, obviously, he thinks that it's going to, you know, uh, allow these Native Americans to live peacefully outside of our um, settled territory. But really, it just moves them to a place that is very difficult for them to live and keep their traditions alive. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, another thing that Andrew Jackson deals with in his presidency is the Second National Bank. The Second National Bank, the owner of it is Nicholas Biddle. He is making loans to members of Congress. Uh, this is all on page 409 through 411. Um, the reason that this is important is because if if somebody is making loans to members of Congress, it's a reasonable possibility that those members of Congress um, – are feeling pressured by that person to do what that person wants. Because, you know, if you owe somebody money, you kind of feel obligated to maybe do them a favor or, you know, something like that. So Andrew Jackson didn't like the National Bank because he thought that the bank uh, owner lending money or loaning money to these members of Congress was going to lead to a whole bunch of corruption. And it, you know, most likely was. So Andrew Jackson tries to get rid of the National Bank. He actually does um, because what he does is he takes all the money out of the national bank and then he puts it into state banks, which at first is a good idea and a good thing, but ultimately it leads to a lot of issues because it causes a whole bunch of inflation and then people start panicking and that leads to the panic of 18. 37, which is that last thing on your study guide. And because of the panic of 1837, a lot of people lose their jobs. We go into a kind of a slump and uh, things just kind of don't go so well for a few years. Um, so that's the third QA. Um, you know, a lot of information to look over. Uh, keep studying. We will have the test uh, on Monday. And so be, make sure you do study over the weekend. If you over the weekend you have questions, you can throw them up on Twitter or Facebook. We'll get get answers for you. Um, and uh, yeah, so just keep studying, and um, we'll take the test on Monday. So good luck.